another day, another recap. Today we'll be diving into another action-packed movie franchise. This adrenaline-fueled trilogy will consist of the movies Escape Plan, Escape Plan Hades, and lastly Escape Plan The Extractors. Without further ado make sure you're comfortable and as always sit back, relax and enjoy the recap. The movie kicks off at Bendwater Federal Penitentiary. A prisoner watches his surroundings intensely, and eventually a fight breaks out among the inmates. The culprit is then immediately arrested and moved to isolation. Planning an escape route, he observes everything around him over the next few days including the time when the guards take a break. Eventually, the day dawns when an explosion in the prison's parking serves as a distraction for him to make a run. After being dropped off by the main road, he gets spotted by the local sheriff's department and is taken back to prison. The agitated warden is then introduced to Lester Clark, the CEO of an independent security firm responsible for looking into the weaknesses of the country's maximum security prisons. He informs the warden that the runaway prisoner was his business partner, Ray Breslin, and that he has been posing as an inmate at all other facilities as well for the past seven years paid by none other than the government. Proving the level of his expertise, Ray then details his escape for the warden to emphasize the vulnerable points of his prison, having narrowed down to the isolation unit as the weak link because of its proximity to an unguarded fire station, Ray says he simply made enemies and initiated a fight. Once that landed him in isolation, he observed that there was less than necessary staff around, and when they take their break it implies seven minutes without any security around. When prodded about the code to exit his cell, Ray says he used the lamination inside the chocolate milk box to lift the numbers off the keypad, and then easily tried all the combinations when the guards took a break. After all this he still had enough time left to mess with the camera footage, get to the fire garage undetected and hitch a ride to the prison's parking. In LA at their company's office a few days later, the business partners and their colleagues Abigail and Hush have a meeting with Jessica Miller, a lawyer with the CIA. Jessica informs them about a new privately funded secret prison for disappeared persons, that the investors want to ensure it is escape-proof. This divides the team with Lester agreeing with the offer since it would pay them double their usual fees, but the others were not so easily convinced about things being primarily unofficial. With Jessica's additional condition that the location of the prison remains unknown to the team, Abigail seems completely against accepting the offer. Nonetheless, Ray accepts the task and is informed that he will soon be picked up by private contractors. In New Orleans the next day, Ray is briefed about his fake identity with Warden Marsh being his emergency contact in the prison, and is also given an evacuation code. Refusing to go completely unknown about his whereabouts, Abigail gets Hush to implant a tracking microchip in his arm. Taking his leave Ray then waits to be picked up. However, things immediately go sideways when he is tasered the moment he is captured and the microchip is removed from his arm. To make matters worse he is knocked out as well. He briefly gains consciousness during transit and sees a man being killed. After some time his blindfolds are finally taken off and he finds himself already in his prison cell amongst several others. But these cells are nothing like he's ever seen before and immediately gets into a meeting with the warden. He says the evacuation code and quickly realizes that this is not the same warden he was told about earlier, and he realizes that he's in deep trouble. With a different warden than expected, a useless evacuation code and no knowledge of his location, this was certainly not his usual assignment. Meanwhile his team continues to do their best to find Ray but have nothing as of yet. In the common area of the prison, Ray grabs the attention of Emil Rotmeyer who comes over to introduce himself. He says that he used to do security for Victor Mannheim and asks if Ray knew him. When Ray denies having heard of him, Emil tells him that Victor is a Robin Hood hero who stole from the rich for the poor. He says that he was expected to provide information about him to lead to his capture but he had no intention to cooperate with the authorities. The next day in his office Warden Hobbs reprimands Drake, one of the guards, for being responsible for an inmate's death, with his punishment being the loss of a month's salary. Drake is disappointedly angry when he leaves. Emil carefully observes Ray looking around his cell before speaking to him again in the common area the next day. Promising to help Ray out whenever he needs a favor, Emil leaves him alone. Ray then looks around trying to learn everything he can about the place when Emil joins him yet again. Calling in his favor, Ray tells him that he needs to see the isolation area. In a split second, he is punched by Emil, and everyone gathers to witness their fight. Egging Ray on, Emil gets him to fight back. Putting an end to the intense entertainment of the inmates, the guards taser them both apart and transfer them to isolation. Their extremely bright lights make staying in small quarters even more difficult. Despite the bothersome lights, Ray attempts to feel around the place to get an idea of what he is dealing with. At BNC security, Abigail and Hush confront Lester about the strangeness of the operation and he promises to call the CIA to investigate further. Meanwhile, a doctor visits Ray in his isolation cell and declares him all right to which Drake orders him to be taken out. Meeting Emil in the common area, he tells him that he needs a round and thin piece of metal as a favor and offers to get him out of prison in return. 
Strangely, Emil informs one of the guards that he wishes to speak to Warden Hobbs, meeting him for an interrogation. He continues to refuse to give out any information regarding Victor Mannheim leading to torture as ordered by the Warden. However, before he is taken away, he smartly manages to snag a piece of metal from under the table. Passing it over to Ray later, he then demands some answers. Ray honestly tells him about his job of breaking out of prisons, and informs him of the setup that resulted in him being there. Saying that he doesn't know who wants him gone, he adds that he will need Emil to send him back to isolation after creating a diversion. Over the next few days, Ray tells Emil everything that his observations have revealed about the place. He says that seeing as how all the construction around them was vertical, it was a possibility that they were underground. Having felt about in the isolation box, he says that there was something under it that could be followed to the surface. He then reveals why he needed a piece of metal. Having found steel rivets in the isolation box, he intended to focus the heat of the lights by exposing a toothpaste polished metal to open the panel without having to cut through anything. To create a diversion for Ray, Emil picks a fight with another inmate, Javid Afridi. Ray also fights with a few people to ensure that he gets sent to the isolation box along with Emil and Javid. Once there, he holds the prized metal piece in place exposed to the lights and concentrates its heat on the rivets one at a time. Once he gets them all out, he signals to Emil who immediately begins screaming to garner the attention of the guards. Covering the camera in his box with a piece of bread he smuggled in, Ray goes down the outlet he discovered. As Warden Hobbs makes his way to the isolation boxes himself, Ray continues his exploration. Emil goes on screaming to buy more time, but Warden Hobbs eventually gets to his box. While he pretends to pray to distract him, Ray climbs upwards and accidentally breaks something which causes water to gush out. But upon reaching the surface he comes to the realization that not only are they aboard a massive ship, but they are also in the middle of the ocean. Quickly getting back before being noticed he makes his way back to his isolation box. However, the place is now quite flooded with water seeping into the isolation boxes as well. With much difficulty, Ray manages to reach his box, put the panel back and grab the piece of bread from the camera just in time for him to be let out and join the others. Meanwhile, Abigail and Hush report to Lester about the payment for Ray's assignment being frozen. He tells them that it is the federal government they are dealing with here, so this could be standard procedure. He also says that he spoke to Jessica and that everything is okay. Back at the prison, the warden sees the rivets loose in Ray's isolation box. Drake says that they must have come off because of the water's pressure. Having made the connection, Warden Hobbs places a call to inquire why he wasn't informed about Ray's presence in his prison and why he was using a fake name instead. Surprisingly, it is Lester on the other end who asks him to keep Ray there forever to prove that the prison is indeed escape-proof. He further informs him that Mannheim is planning something big to take down the banking systems of the world and urges him to get details of his whereabouts from Emil. Promptly recruiting Drake for the task, Hobbs gets him to attack Ray while he sleeps and continues to torture him over the next few days. Ray seems to lose his spirit even as Emil desperately tries to motivate him to stay strong and keep thinking of a way to escape. However, Ray continues to be singled out to receive beatings by Drake. One such day, Emil demands to know why Ray decided to spend his life in prison. Ray tells him that he used to be a prosecutor and that a man he had helped put in jail had escaped and put an end to his family. Hush in the meantime comes across a for-profit and fully illegal prison with the codename The Tomb run by terrible ex-military individuals. But he adds that there was no way to actually find the place. Meanwhile, Ray and Emil discuss the routine of the guards around them. Since they all remain masked at all times, they don't know their faces or even their names but that doesn't deter them. Focusing on the habits of the guards that Ray has observed during his time at the tomb, they give them all code names and even discuss which guards would be more difficult to handle than the others. Glad about getting back Ray's spirit, Emil is more than pleased to continue with their next step and stages a stabbing to send Ray to the doctor. Appealing to the doctor's profession, Ray tries to ask him where they were but he doesn't get an answer. Nonetheless, he pretends to fall off during his stitches and quickly grabs some medical supplies and hides them. After getting stitched up, he returns to Emil and quickly moving on to his next idea. He gets Emil to acquire a pen and a fellow inmate's glasses. Secretly putting together a contraption using them and the medical supplies he nabbed, Ray discreetly hands over his handmade sextant to Emil. Having noticed something odd about them, Warden Hobbs has Ray brought over just as he tells Emil that they need to get the sextant to the surface. As Ray gets hit and dragged, Emil quickly hides the device. Warden Hobbs transfers Ray to a new section and lets him know that he knows his real identity. He even tells him that he made use of his observations and reports while designing the facility. When Ray threatens to take down the whole place when he finally escapes, Hobbs takes away whatever little privileges of wreck time and showers he has in there. Ray then offers to provide information on Mannheim which gets the Warden's attention. He offers Ray a deal to let him go if they nab Mannheim based on the information he gives them. Accepting the deal, Ray gives all sorts of false and meaningless information about Mannheim to Warden Hobbs. On the other hand, he furthers his plan with Emil by asking him to give the sextant to Javid to find their location. Despite the initial animosity between them, 
Javed is included in their escape plan. He promptly reports to Warden Hobbs that while he doesn't know all the details, there is an escape being planned. In return for this information he demands to be able to take God's name in the open air. For this he is taken to a chamber from where the sky is visible. The guards leave him alone while he prays there and he grabs the chance to use Ray's sextant to discreetly obtain a reading. Based on Javed's findings and his own observations, Ray concludes that they were off the coast of Morocco. Emil immediately offers a contact in Casablanca who would be willing to help. To get a message out to him, Ray makes yet another visit to the doctor's office. Reminding Dr. Kyrie of the Hippocratic Oath, he tells him about his book in the warden's office and asks him to read a particular page. He confesses the truth of his identity later when summoned by Dr. Kyrie, which leads to the addition of another member on their team. He then supplies fake location information about Mannheim to Warden Hobbs. Knowing that the warden closely follows him, he taps out a code in his cell that translates to an upcoming riot of the inmates of a particular block. Meanwhile, Dr. Kyrie gets Emil's message to his contact asking for help the next day. Diverting most of the guards to one block leaves just two guards in the common area where Javid picks a fight leading to chaos everywhere. Warden Hobbs realizes that he has been fooled and quickly orders the guards to get back to the common area where they engage smoke bombs and eventually open fire. Amidst all the chaos, Ray takes down a guard and arms himself with his watch and gun before sneaking away with Emil and Javid. Confident about making it out of the tomb, Ray reveals their team to Warden Hobbs through the camera before disabling it and the entire system with it, ordering a complete lockdown in retaliation. Hobbs manages to thwart their attempt to get to the surface and orders Drake to get them back. While looking for an alternative way to leave the group gets ambushed by Drake and his team. Ray shoots back but Javid is shot, and they somehow manage to evade Drake and get an injured Javid to safety. Wondering how they were found so quickly despite disabling the cameras, Ray realizes that there are motion sensors everywhere and proceeds to disable them as well. This gets Warden Hobbs to speak directly to Ray and inform him that no matter what tricks are pulled he will continue to be in control. Ray then tells Emil that he will shut off the main power to disable the lockdown and leaves. Emil tries to convince Javid that they can still escape together, but he just asks for his gun and sends him away. Meanwhile, Warden Hobbs directs Drake to the engine room anticipating Ray to get there soon. Left on his own, Javid opens fire at the guards to buy as much time as possible but is eventually taken down. Drake continues to chase Ray but he avoids getting shot even as Warden Hobbs needlessly shoots Javid. Finally taking on Drake outside the engine room, Ray knocks his gun away. An intense fight ensues between them with Ray eventually shoving Drake down the stairs to end his life. He then proceeds to the engine room and successfully shuts off the tomb's power allowing Emil to open the door to the surface. Meanwhile a helicopter sent by Mannheim finally arrives and opens fire even as the ship's personnel request for the tomb's guards for backup. The helicopter then lands on the ship as Emil emerges and heads towards freedom. On the other hand, Ray spots the water fuel conversion tanks and devises a new plan just as Warden Hobbs orders his men to take him down for good. Amidst cover fire, Emil reaches the helicopter and quickly grabs a gun to fire at the approaching guards, thereby buying time for Ray. While Ray hides inside the water tank, Warden Hobbs continues to hunt for him. With more guards continuously replacing the ones being taken down, Emil realizes that it is a losing battle and retreats into the helicopter as the power turns back on. Ray is then submerged as the water in the tank continues to rise and outside, Mannheim's helicopter takes off with Emil on board. Hobbs realizes Ray's plan and the tank flushes Ray out below the ship. He starts swimming up to the surface and Emil spots him. Lowering the helicopter, he throws down a rope. Still refusing to give up, Hobbs shoots at the helicopter. Ray asks Emil to throw him a gun and he immediately shoots at multiple oil cans on board even as Emil gets shot by Hobbs. Hobbs then stares in the face of defeat as Ray causes an explosion leading to the end of Hobbs and yet another successful escape attempt by Ray. After landing at a Moroccan beach, the two of them are approached by Jessica who is introduced to Ray as Emile's daughter. He then realizes that Emile is actually Victor Mannheim himself, and that the entire assignment was designed to get him out of the tomb. Before leaving, Jessica informs Ray that Lester immediately went to the investors of the tomb behind her back and even arranged Ray's transport there. Getting in contact with Abigail later, Ray is told about Lester being offered the CEO position of the tomb if it was proven to be escape-proof which is why he wanted Ray to stay there forever. Having tracked him down to Miami, Hush knocks Lester unconscious. He wakes up later to find himself locked in a shipping container. With Lester finally shipped off, Abigail and Ray make their way back home. The second movie opens up during a rescue mission at Chechnya. Field operator Luke is beaten up by his abductors, while another operator, Shu, poses as a hostage among two others. Their other teammate Jasper poses as one of the captors. The four hostages are then taken to a room together with a camera aimed at them. Jasper aims his gun at Luke and out of nowhere the camera explodes which creates a diversion long enough for the hostages to take out their captors and go running. They hide inside a cell when more reinforcements approach. With the facility looking for them, one of their captors realizes where the group escaped from. 
Jasper rushes to their location with the sirens blaring, and in the meantime both Luke and Shu take out all armed men in their vicinity and run. The duo realize that Jasper wasn't where he was supposed to be as per their plan, and as Shu hotwires their getaway vehicle, Jasper joins them. They get going when an explosion occurs, but soon realize that Jasper's 40-second delay has caused one of the hostages to lose their life. Jasper tries to defend himself and says he went to disarm their enemy's weapons which was not part of the plan. Seems he has a dependency on an algorithm which led to his deviance and the death of a hostage. Knowing that Ray will not appreciate losing a hostage, Hush and Abigail lead them back. At Breslin Security's office in Atlanta, Ray fires Jasper for trusting his half-cooked computer program more than his team. Citing Jasper's example over a game of Go later, he then advises Xu about the importance of learning to differentiate between ego and intuition. In Shanghai a year later, Xu meets his cousin, Yusheng Ma of Yusheng Technologies which is on the verge of announcing innovative satellite communications tech to the world. Speaking to Yusheng's sister Qin, Xu learns of her fear for her brother's life. She tells him that after he refused Swiss tech giant Russo's offer to buy him out thrice, she is scared something might happen. Since Yusheng refuses to take a bodyguard, Qin requests Xu to accompany him to Bangkok over the weekend. While leaving the party with a drunk Yusheng, Xu spots a couple of masked guys blocking their way. He then proceeds to fight them off and while they prove to be quite an easy fight, once he's completed dismantling his opponents, another man appears to fire a stun gun which knocks him out. When he wakes up later, Xu is welcomed by an automated voice named Galileo to a place called Hades. Surrounded by hundreds of people in a coliseum-like stadium, Galileo informs him that he is to participate in a battle in the zoo. Forced to fight a stranger amongst a cheering audience who gives it his all, and after an entertainingly intense battle, he knocks out his opponent and is declared the winner. Xu is then awarded two hours of sanctuary time. For this, a recreational space appears in the zoo as the other inmates including Yusheng make their way out, he goes into the quite relaxing room and with that, the scene cuts to Luke telling Hush that Chin told him that both Xu and her brother dropped off the radar. At Hades, Xu is surprised to see Jasper there as an inmate, but does not get the time to approach him before they are ordered to get into their respective cells. Alone in his cell, Xu channels all his attention to raise fundamental guidelines about breaking out of prisons. To successfully stage an escape he understands that he will need information about the layout of Hades and the routine that is followed to find a weakness. He also wonders about who among the inmates he could ask for help and trust that they will hold up their end of the deal. During his interrogation by the Warden of Hades, Xu realizes that a lot of his and Yusheng's background information is already known. The Warden tells him that while Yusheng parted with important information about one of his patents, he is withholding details about another patent. Having identified himself merely as the zookeeper, the warden asks Xu to acquire the remaining details from his money-minded cousin. Xu learns from Yusheng later that the patent was with regards to a game-changing satellite communications tech that could easily override and control any computer system globally, which would be a catastrophe. The duo there approach Jasper who is shocked to see Xu there. He tells him that both of them being captured in Hades could mean that someone was looking for Ray. Saying that he might have been there for a couple of months already, he explains that the battle days at Hades are always tough to endure, seeing as the losers and the ones who refuse to fight aren't as lucky as the winners who are rewarded. Meanwhile through his sources Ray determines that the investors of the tomb are possibly the same people behind Hades. Fortified in such a way that whoever goes there is never seen again, he says the company Russia might be behind it. An eager Luke volunteers to get to Hades but Ray refuses to send him. Nonetheless, going behind Ray's back, Hush provides Luke the contact details of someone he knows at Rushow to further look into things. Later, a data breach into Rushow's deals reveals information that they've been paying a dark bank account. Abigail further adds that a private prison industry lobbyist Leon Grassi received 10 million from Rushow as well. Ray then makes his way to a contact named Trent DeRosa who will set up a meeting with Leon. Once there, Ray goes to confront the man but before getting any information from him, the arrival of several masked men interrupts the gathering. On the field after a long time, Ray proves that he has not lost his touch by taking down multiple guys. Trent also matches his energy, but when Leon problematically is shot by one of the remaining masked men who is then killed, Trent is instead recruited to help find Hades. In the zoo at Hades, Shu notices a new face and speaking to the man reveals that he is the cook there. Shu is quickly brushed off by the man who walks away. Suddenly spotting his opponent from the battle on his first day, Xu picks a fight with him despite it being a truce day. But as the fighting continues, everyone involved is soon tasered and the fight is brought to an abrupt end. Xu briefly gains consciousness to find himself in the company of a robot that was healing his injuries. Later when Akala approaches him, Xu tells him that he picked a fight with him in the hopes of meeting a doctor and looking around the place. Meanwhile Luke finds himself in the midst of a car chase and informs Hush that his contact at Russia wasn't much help but that he was following a new lead the man he is currently chasing. As Luke chases the man they both end up inside a warehouse. The other car then takes off and locks the place down trapping Luke inside. 
At Hades, when Yusheng tells Xu about being tortured again, he urges him to try and be mentally strong. Forced to battle in a pair soon later, Xu then promptly defeats both the opponents and earn his team some sanctuary time. He uses this time in the best possible way to map out whatever he knows about the layout of Hades, and then discusses with Jasper how there is a lot happening on the other side of the cells, such as hallways, infirmary, interrogation, and the headquarters. Following Luke's disappearance, Abigail looks into the matter and discovers that the last number he called belonged to Rusho in Geneva. She then asks Hush why he let Luke go against Ray's direct orders and him trusting Luke is enough to cop a bit of a scolding. Meanwhile, captured at the warehouse, Luke wakes up to find himself at Hades. Meeting up with the others later, it is now clear that all of them being there together cannot be a coincidence. Asking them to be aware of their surroundings, Shu tells Jasper and Luke to keep contact among them to a bare minimum. Determined to make an escape he finally manages to befriend the cook, and asks him to count the steps from his cell to the kitchen in an attempt to fill in the missing blanks in his layout map. This reveals that the distance varies from day to day. Intending to find out how that happens, Shu makes a deal with Luke during their battle to let him win. Grabbing a pencil from the sanctuary after his win, he then makes discreet complimentary marks on the floor and the wall of the zoo. When he spots the marks were separated and across the room from each other the next day, he concludes that Hades is a dynamic prison. However, constant movement implies that there isn't a layout, and the use of automation everywhere means there isn't even a routine to poke through for weaknesses. Instead, Jasper offers to get the help of the Legion, a bunch of computer nerds with their leader count zero having the entire layout of the prison somewhere on his servers. But the challenge is to figure out the leader amongst them before the zookeeper does. Following through on his promise to Ray, Trent gets a contact of his to find the owner of the Dark account. Once he's done he goes to a back room and it's finally time to get locked and loaded. Meanwhile the zookeeper's patience regarding Yusheng's patent runs thin and he gets three inmates to defeat him in battle. This compels Xu to approach the Legion and he offers them sanctuary time in return for the layout of Hades. Later, when their opponents refuse to fight them, the members of the Legion win by default and are awarded sanctuary time. Experiencing its peace for the first time, Count Zero is glad to be of assistance to Shu. However, he is caught by prison guards the next day, and Shu wonders how they figured out his identity. Luke informs him of Jasper's way of working on his own, the duo realizes that since they shared all the information with him, he must be working for Hades. Jasper then walks into the room with a suit and clarifies to them that he actually runs the entire operation. Having found out from Trent that the owner of the dark bank account that received money from Russo indeed belonged to Jasper, a determined Ray decides to locate Hades with help from Hush. Back at Hades, Jasper explains to Shu and Luke that after the tomb's investors lost a ton of money because of Ray, they were on the lookout for an upgrade on the layout as well as how it is run. When they found out that Ray cut off one of his own, they approached him, and Jasper finally got to use his beloved algorithms for a completely automated prison system. He also tells them that every inmate at Hades owns a precious piece of intel that he intends to sell to its highest bidder. To teach them a lesson, Shu and Luke are pitted against all the inmates at Hades later in a thoroughly outnumbered contest. While they get beaten by several inmates, Jasper asks the zookeeper to ensure that Shu fights a battle every day till Hades breaks his spirit and he gets Yusheng to reveal his tech secret. Determined to get his revenge and to prove his worth to the investors, Jasper captures Ray to be brought to Hades. What he doesn't know though, is that it was exactly what Ray wanted. Once at Hades, Ray is challenged by Jasper to show him why intuitions and teamwork are better than his algorithms and machines. To prove his point, Jasper pits Ray in a battle against the other inmates while denying Shu and Luke entry to the zoo. Just as Jasper hoped, helplessly watching Ray get defeated and beaten manages to break Shu. Elsewhere, Trent gets a call for help from Hush following Ray's capture, Yusheng in the meantime tells Shu not to lose hope, and with that, Shu decides to devise a new plan which won't be easy to predict for Jasper. Meanwhile, Ray gets in touch with Hush through a communication device hidden in his tooth. He is informed that despite managing to get through Galileo's firewall at Hades, they have access to only part of the layout. Hush tells him that since this was insufficient to plan an exit they need Yusheng to work on an access point inside Hades. After Hush confirms that he can manipulate the cameras for about a minute, Ray asks if he can take over Galileo's voice box. In the zoo, Shu hears Galileo speaking in the Qingdao dialect as a signal from Ray, and after Hush accesses the cameras, the two finally meet. Ray quickly relays all the information to Shu and asks him to get Yusheng to help them. Trent then calls Hush to tell him that he's heading to the warehouse where Luke was captured. Inside his cell, Luke receives his food but discovers a hidden message inside it. They tell Akala to get ready and Yusheng is stressing as he told the zookeeper a fake spec and he will soon realize it was a lie. The team then begins stealing and bringing whatever they have together. After collecting what they need, Yusheng creates with what he can use and eventually provides Hush an internal access point. Taking it further, Hush is then able to not just locate Hades but also map its entire layout. The Legion and some other men are told about the escape soon to happen, and they all agree to help. 
Hush gives Ray about three minutes to do what he can before Galileo reboots. When the time is right, Hush hits Galileo and causes a system failure. With all systems down, the group attempts to move the wall by hand and eventually do so. A massive firefight quickly ensues with Galileo turning back on. The group begin dismantling some guards and Trent is alerted to the location of Hades. The group meanwhile head to the medical center where the remaining members of the Legion attempt to gain control of Hades. Leaving Akala to cover for them, Ray, Shu, Luke and Yusheng proceed further. Confident about the ability of his algorithm to respond to this intrusion, Jasper cuts all communication systems and begins resetting Hades' structure. Once the restructuring is complete, Jasper releases gas on Ray and his team, quickly finding the nearest point of exit they make it out of the gas chamber. Problematically, the terminal in the medical center has gone rogue, and so Jasper sends a unit for them. Akala opens fire at them but realizes there is too much and locks the door instead. Luke in the meantime is then separated from the rest of the group and while Shu goes to get his teammate, Ray and Yusheng head to the control room. At the medical lab, the door is blown apart and when the Legion resists, they are shot. The zookeeper then enters and kills off Akala personally. Meanwhile, Ray gets to the control room to finally face Jasper. Appreciating Jasper's efforts to make Hades and Galileo, he tells him that while the system might seem like it has no weaknesses, there is always at least one point of vulnerability. While looking for Luke, Shu suddenly comes into contact with the zookeeper. Without a weapon, the zookeeper uses his knife and Shu immediately deflects the blows while throwing some of his own. The fight gets more intense and this time, two knives are not enough to hold Shu back who kills the zookeeper and declares himself as the new boss. Ray meanwhile tells Jasper about tracing the dark bank account to him. While he speaks, Yusheng disables Galileo's solar system, and Trent reaches the location just in time to spot the opening. As Shu and Yusheng run away from the armed guards of Hades, Ray names Jasper as the one weakness of his creation. Knowing Jasper and his need to prove himself right, Ray expected to be captured and willingly came to Hades just to show him that Hades is not escape-proof. Just as Jasper realizes his blunder, Trent forces his way through the main door. Luke problematically though is trapped in the sights of some armored guards. Out of nowhere, Trent appears and absolutely destroys all men in his sight. Meanwhile, Ray wants to see what Jasper can do without his tech. Without the power of machines to guide him, Jasper seems to be no match for Ray's prowess in hand-to-hand -hand combat. While they continue fighting, Trent completely destroys the control room. Jasper eventually starts winning the fight against Ray. But with a second of hesitation, Ray puts Jasper in a lock and kills him. With Galileo completely out of commission, Shu and Yusheng emerge out of Hades into a church to which they make their way outside to be safely extracted. Ray enters the control room to finalize things when suddenly the group responsible for the tomb as well as Hades appears on a screen. Ray sends him a threat and the movie shuts to a close. The final movie opens up in Mansfield, Ohio where Daya John wants to purchase a factory she's come across. Her bodyguard Bao thinks this isn't the right fit. Before making a final decision, she speaks to her father in Hong Kong, the owner of Zhang Innovations. Their conversation is interrupted when Mr. Zhang gets an offer from the royal family to build a copy of the tomb under the desert. He asks for 12 billion for the task and then continues the conversation with Daya. He tells her that opening plants outside China might not be a great idea for them, but she relents and makes her decision. Before leaving Ohio, she meets the mayor who is honored that Zhang Innovations thinks their town is worthy of setting up a factory there and assures her of his cooperation for the move. When she is about to get on her private plane, Bao realizes something is wrong around the hangar. His hunch is proved right when mercenaries posing as workers attack the group and Bao proceeds to take them down. Unfortunately, he does not escape and is knocked out. Daya ends up getting taken hostage along with a few other employees. A man then plants a USB drive with Ray Breslin's name on an unconscious bow. In LA, Ray is on his way to acquire a disc that will let him cut ties with Lester Clark's black site activity. Speaking to him on the phone, Abigail explains how important it was for Breslin's security and for Ray to have a clean image. Meanwhile, a man waits to meet a certain Mr. Chow while introducing himself to the receptionist simply as Mr. Friend. Anticipating danger, several bodyguards gradually surround him, and in perfect retaliation he surprisingly uses his umbrella and briefcase to take them down. With the obstacles out of his way, he uses the receptionist's access card to enter the office. He quickly knocks out Mr. Chow and searches his pockets and finds a disc only to Ray hold him at gunpoint. Mr. Friend introduces himself as Shen Lo, and hence offers to check the contents together and make a deal that Shen is free to have the disc for himself if it doesn't carry any potential harm for Ray. In Mansfield, Bao is being interrogated by the police when Mr. Zhang arrives and confronts him about Daya's disappearance. When he replies that he has no idea as to who her captor is, Mr. Zhang gets violent and is hurriedly taken out of the interrogation room. Left to himself, Bao then comes across the USB drive in his pocket. Meanwhile, Shen accompanies Ray to meet Hush and Abigail. Hush is then satisfied that neither Ray nor Breslin Security's name appears anywhere in the USB. Shen informs Ray that Lester used to be in business with Mr. Zhang, and that he himself used to be the head of security. 
but after obtaining a lot of money through the technology at the black site prisons which he cleans through Zhang innovations, and as Daya is his friend, taking down Mr. Zhang is personal. Just then, Bao arrives and hands over the USB drive to Ray. Watching the video reveals that Daya has been kidnapped by Lester's son Lester Clark Jr. Abigail and Shen then deduce the video was filmed in a prison chapel somewhere around Russia, and Ray immediately calls for Trent's help. Trent is easily able to trace the video to a location in Latvia known as Devil's Station. Agreeing to work together, he then promises to arrange for their transportation. Leaving Hush in LA, Abigail insists on joining Ray and heads home to pack a bag for both of them. Meanwhile Daya and the rest of her employees arrive at Devil's Station. While Daya tries to convince Lester Jr. to spare them, he makes an example out of one of her employees and ends his life. Shen in the meantime conducts his own interrogation with Bao and blames him for losing Daya. Knowing his fault well enough, Bao is thoroughly disappointed with himself and simply agrees with Shen, getting back to the office of Breslin Security with their luggage. Abigail is speaking to Ray on the phone when she is suddenly abducted. In Mansfield, Mr. Zhang receives a video call from Lester Jr. while the police attempt to track his location, intending to seek revenge for the loss of his father's life and how Mr. Zhang did nothing to help despite having good business relations with him. Lester Jr. threatens to end his existence as well as his business. He demands $700 million in ransom and to prove his point he executes a hostage. After the call he gets the rest of the hostages through the various cells of Devil's Station and informs Daya that he gets paid handsomely by plenty of powerful people to capture and keep its inmates imprisoned. The hostages are then locked in their respective cells. Even as Ray leaves for Belarus with Shen and Bao, Lester Jr. heads over to meet Abigail, sour about his father being pushed out of the company he built with Ray. He blames her for not doing anything to help. She tries to convince him that she has nothing to do with any of it, but he refuses to budge from his opinion. Once Ray meets Trent in Belarus, Shen places a call to Mr. Zhang. He scrolls through his photographs with Daya while suggesting Mr. Zhang to not answer calls from the kidnapper to keep her alive for as long as possible. The group then makes its way to Devil's Station along with Trent. From among the remaining hostages, Lester Jr. forces Daya to confirm who had the highest security clearance. Sensing danger when she refuses to push any of her employees under the bus, one of the hostages, Wong offers himself up. Nonetheless, another hostage ends up executed, and Wong is taken away from his cell for further questioning. Threatened at gunpoint, he is then compelled to reveal the future development plans of Zhang Innovations. While a laptop is arranged for him to hack into company details, Ray and the team arrive at Devil's Station. Hush investigates the area with a drone and thermal mapping reveals that Lester Jr. is running a black site prison of his own with about 40 prisoners. When nobody seems to be making a move, Bao is irritated. However, Ray shuts him down saying that they will decide their next steps only after gathering all the possible information. Choosing to work on his own however, Trent and his ammunition of Dragon's Breath get going. While Lester Jr. contemplates what to do with Abigail, one of his men Frankie urges him to remember that getting ransom money from Mr. Zhang is their main objective. He asks him not to be distracted by his need to get revenge for his father, and even suggests that they should just end Abigail's life and be done with it. Meanwhile Ray and the group split up for their ambush of the Devil's Station. With Trent on his own path, Ray makes his way alone through the tunnels of the sewer system which leaves Shen and Bao waiting together on the outside. Lester Jr. is alerted of their arrival and accordingly gets all his men to be seemingly unseen. Ray realizes something is wrong when Shen reports that there isn't anyone around the security tower and asks him to stay alert moving ahead. Using Daya as bait, Lester Jr. cuffs her on the ledge of a balcony ensuring that she can easily be spotted from outside. Realizing the trap laid for them, Shen decides not to engage right away but Bao disregards the decision and lurches ahead. Shen follows and tries to stop him by saying that they should wait for Ray's opinion. However, Bao is not interested in waiting to get to Daya's rescue anymore. Unfortunately, they are then taken down by multiple landmines going off and end up getting caught. Lester Jr. then thanks Bao for leading him straight to Ray and reveals that his USB drive had a tracker which enabled Abigail's abduction. Knowing that Ray is listening in once Daya and Abigail are brought in, Lester Jr. shoots Bao. He then video calls Ray to show him Abigail's death. Hurt and disappointed in himself, Ray continues to make his way through the tunnels even as Frankie looks for him there. Realizing that there is someone else in the tunnels with him, Ray waits to make his move when Frankie gets to him. Swiftly taking him down with multiple stabs he then proceeds further. Completely taken over by Abigail's loss, Ray takes down several more of Lester Jr.'s men on his way. Meanwhile Daya and Shen are put in separate cells where he immediately begins to look for a way to escape. Finally, out of the tunnels, Ray finds his way to the chapel. Back in Mansfield, Mr. Zhang remains true to Shen's instructions and refuses to answer a call from Lester Jr. despite being urged to by the police. Meanwhile after gathering enough scrap paper from the wall of his cell, Shen uses a taser he stole earlier to start a fire and free himself from the tie around his wrists. Finally Trent arrives armed with Dragon's Breath. 
The smoke in Shen's cell quickly garners the attention of the other inmates. Daya notices as well and their captors go to see what's happening inside. As the door is opened, Shen quickly disarms his first attacker then quickly takes care of the second. Shen grabs the key to Daya's cell to free her and more armed men arrive. Daya is freed from her cell but she and Shen are held at gunpoint until they both duck to Trent absolutely killing all assailants in the room without mercy. The duo then takes off to safety while Trent just presses his trigger. Lester Jr. and his men watch what just occurred, and he gives them orders in an attempt to rectify the situation. Continuing to make his way through the cells, Trent is ambushed and gets into close quarters with a man which results in his weapon being forced out, while he takes a beating initially. Trent doesn't give up and as round two begins, Trent still receives a mad belting. He tries to fight back but his opponent is quite strong and eventually, Trent super slams and ends his opponent. Daya tells Shen that they need to rescue Wong before he divulges information. Meanwhile in a brave show of defiance, Wong refuses to reveal company secrets and is saved when Shen comes to his rescue just in time. This gives way to an intense fight and Shen tells the man to fight outside. The man agrees and this leads to an intense fight. Daya tells Wong to hide behind the wall with her and Shen uses all his combat experience to assist him until he is smacked to the ground. He quickly gets up and returns the favor. Deciding enough is enough he both defends and attacks with perfect precision and accuracy. However his opponent refuses to give up and keeps coming at him till Shen twists and breaks his foot. He smirks and delivers the final blow to kill his adversary. Shen gives Daya a hug and together they walk to the exit. Meanwhile Ray and Lester Jr. finally face each other and engage in a shootout. As the men each grapple with revenge and loss, they shoot and get closer to each other. Lester Jr. then manages to not just injure Ray but he also disarms him in the process. Nonetheless, Ray's determination for revenge allows him to take on Lester Jr. Ray's feelings for the loss of Abigail compels him to continuously hit Lester Jr. With barely any resistance to the beating, Ray makes sure that the killer of his friend will result in nothing but death. He returns the favor and slices Lester Jr. before throwing him a couple stories down. The other three link up with Ray and Shen offers his condolences while Daya and Wong express their gratitude. Waiting for his daughter in Mansfield, Mr. Zhang watches as a plane lands with his daughter inside it. However, when she exits the plane, her father receives a stiff greeting from her. Now that she knows of his involvement with Black Sight Prisons, he decides to be with Shen instead, accepting her by his side. Shen shows Mr. Zhang and Ray the disc that started it all, implying that he intends to keep it safe for use in the future. Mr. Zhang miserably walks away, and left alone with his friend, Trent urges Ray to forgive himself for losing Abigail. Replying that it isn't easy convincing himself about it not being his fault, Ray informs Trent of his decision to be done with prisons. Glad about the verdict, Trent immediately offers him an assignment in South America. Interestingly, Bao is seen having survived his shooting and desperately makes his way down a dark tunnel towards an escape. Moments later, Ray descends the same tunnel implying that he is tracking Bao. That's the end of this movie franchise recap. If you enjoyed it make sure to leave a like and subscribe. And as always see you on the next one.